Greetings everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Brother Carl Tester again, and I'm back with what I believe and hope will be a very interesting and encouraging presentation. If you are looking to Jesus for a healing need, or perhaps you are living with other kinds of seemingly insurmountable difficulties in your life, which you believe have been placed there by God, and that this is now your lot in life, well, this presentation is for you, and I hope that it will be helpful in gaining a proper understanding of what God's will is in your life. We are going to take a close look at what is widely known as Paul's thorn in the flesh. Now, while the fact that Paul had a thorn in the flesh is very well known, what is not so well known is precisely what this thorn is and what it is not. And this is what we are going to be unraveling here. And in doing so, we hope that we will dispel some of the common misconceptions that exist around this matter. So without any further delay, let's go on and read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1, where Paul the Apostle is speaking. And he says this, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now in case you are not familiar with the details, I wish to point out that Paul is in fact speaking about himself. He's speaking in the third person. He is the man that was caught up to the third heaven and so on. Some people believe that Paul was raptured into heaven, taken away into heaven at this time, and frankly, that is a ridiculous assumption. However, it is not the purpose of this presentation to deal with this aspect as to why Paul was speaking after this manner at this particular time. So I'm going to press on into verse 4. How? That when... I'll start again. How? that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such in one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So having read that, and with the blessing of the Lord Jesus, let us now consider what Paul was saying when he spoke of this thorn in the flesh. If you're like me, over the years you have probably heard the topic of Paul's thorn in the flesh being discussed among fellow Christians or being spoken about from the front at a meeting. There are a lot of opinions about what this thorn in the flesh is, and similarly there is a lot of misunderstanding in relation to this. Sometimes it is used, or I'm going to say it is misused, by different Christians to hide behind not getting a healing or not being able to get the victory over some kind of significant problem that is holding them back in their walk in the Lord. Some people believe that Paul was sick, but where in the Bible does it actually say that Paul was sick? Others believe that the scriptures indicate that Paul had poor eyesight. Where does it say that in the Bible? Others believe or say that Paul remained sick to the glory of God 
And we too also shouldn't be surprised that we may remain sick to the glory of God. Now, there is some serious misunderstanding here. These are some of the thoughts different people have. Paul was beset by some kind of physical infirmity which God would not heal him of. And Paul glorified in this sickness which he believed was for the glory of God. So we should follow after the same example and be content to live with sickness and disease because these things are sometimes from God and are being used for his own glory. What we declare here and now is that such understanding is totally wrong and is against the will of God and the word of God. God does not want us to be sick. He doesn't want his children to be sick. That's a lie. Jesus came and died for our sins and our sicknesses. Read Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus came to deliver us from sin and sickness. He did not come to give us those things. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should not be the kind of people that submit ourselves to sickness, but rather to the will of God. And the will of God is health and healing. The will of God is freedom from oppression from the devil. The will of God is that we should triumph. And I'm not for one moment suggesting that Jesus has come to take away all of our problems and make our life a bed of roses so that we never have to suffer. So please don't misunderstand or misconstrue what I am saying. This is not why Jesus came. We are expressly told to take up our cross and follow him and that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution and hardship is part and parcel of a normal Christian's walk in the Lord. But rather, what we want to understand is whether or not sickness is given by God to his children. What we want to understand is that if we seek the Lord for healing or deliverance, uh, of some kind from some kind of problem that is holding us back in our walk in the Lord if we should give up after a certain period and then rest on our laurels because God's will is that we should continue to live with that sickness or problem for his own glory we want to find out if this is the correct understanding a Christian should have in relation to these things Others say or think that this thorn was given by God because God wanted to keep Paul humble. And we're going to take a closer look at that. Did Paul have a humility problem that God had to deal with? Was God pegging him back a couple of rungs so he didn't get too high up the spiritual ladder and start boasting? Others believe that we can't know, we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It could have been almost anything. Well, we want to find out exactly what the thorn in the flesh is. And if we let the Bible interpret itself, the identity of the thorn will become abundantly clear. While many believe this is some kind of physical infirmity, some even believe that this might have been some kind of sin problem that Paul had to deal with. And if we knew what it was, we would probably be disappointed with Paul. Can you believe that? You can see that if you take a scripture in isolation, you can twist and warp it to mean almost anything you want. And it can even be used as an excuse to continue in all kinds of, of activity that are wrong. Well, you just got to live with it and God will get the glory in it somehow. Really? And others say, well, like Paul there are some areas in our lives where God says, no, you can't have this area for victory. You won't get victory in this area. Well, what Bible are we reading anyway? We're going to go on and find out, did God actually say no to Paul? You can't have victory in this area of your life. You're going to have to like it and lump it. You're just going to have to live with it. Let's really get into the scriptures and see what the Bible really has to say. Did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my sicknesses. Therefore, I take pleasure in sickness. For when I am sick, then am I strong. 
Was Paul saying that when I am at my sickest, I'm at my best? Does anybody actually believe that? If you are sick right now, dear brother or sister, if you have been living with sickness year in, year out, if you have petitioned Jesus Christ for healing and you have not yet been healed, do you honestly believe that these are now the best days of your life as a Christian because, because God's glory is shining through you more and more, more than if you were healed? If this thinking were true, if we are to believe, having prayed for healing and not being healed, that is now the will of God that we should remain infirmed, if this is how we are to think, then there would be no further need for persistence in prayer. In fact, it would destroy all confidence in prayer. All, we, all each of us would need is for some well-meaning Christian to remind us remind us of the words that Christ spoke to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, God is being glorified in our sickness, and we should now be content to dwell uh, with this for the rest of our lives. If this kind of thinking were true, Christians that find themselves in this situation should not seek the aid of a physician because that would not be glorifying God. That would be lessening his glory than if we remain sick. So in fact, what we should be doing as Christians is praying for each other to get sick so that our fellow Christians might also glorify God. The sicker and weaker each one of us become, becomes, the more God is glorified. Wonderful. You think so? I think not. And if anybody thinks that way, please don't pray for me. Furthermore, if this thinking were true, then we should also, each one of us that's beset by such a sickness or problem, should also possess some kind of abundance of godly revelations like Paul that are the root cause of all of this of this problem this sickness this infirmity whatever it is such that God needs to put us back into our box by making us sick infirmed or beset by some problem so that we don't get too high up the spiritual ladder and start boasting does the Bible teach anywhere that God is glorified in sickness firstly let's start in the Old Testament where it's clear that sickness is part of the curse. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 59, Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sickness, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. On the other hand, health and healing is in fact part of God's blessing for his children. We read in Exodus 15 verse 26, where the Lord said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. Let's go across to the New Testament. Is God glorified in our sickness? Matthew 15, verse 30. And great multitudes came unto him, they came unto the Lord Jesus Christ, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Verse 31, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Praise the Lord. Suppose we read that scripture again through the eyes of someone who feels that God is glorified in them being sick. 
and great multitudes came unto him, and he smote them with many sicknesses, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the speaking made dumb, the whole to be maimed, the walking lamed, and the seeing blinded, and they glorified the God of Israel. I mean, who would believe that? That is ridiculous. It is plain in the scriptures that God is glorified in our healing and our deliverance, and he is not glorified when we remain with a persistent problem, sickness or pain. This is the work of the adversary. This is the work of sin. This is the problem of being in our natural mortal body, which is subject to infirmity. Now, I do want to clarify something here and try and head off a misunderstanding that may develop with some of our listeners. This does not mean that God can't get glory while we are sick. And I'm not saying that for a moment. Most especially when we have a good attitude, when we are persistent, when we don't give up, when we remain faithful and so on. Nevertheless, we need to contrast this with the fact that sickness is not the work of Jesus Christ. It is not his will. And he is rather glorified when we are healed and delivered from any and all kinds of bondage. So God can be glorified while we are sick. God gets the glory in everything. I've, I, I've got no doubt about that. But he is much more glorified when we are healed. And I hope that you believe this. Back to the Old Testament, Malachi 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Matthew 4, verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Matthew 12, verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Luke 4, verse 40. Now the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and healed them. Luke 6 verse 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. In Matthew 13 verse 58, we read, and, he, and Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Does this mean that Jesus Christ was unable to heal, heal some of these people? No, it doesn't mean that at all. When we read the context of Matthew chapter 13, we find that he's come into his own country and the people there could hardly believe this was Jesus. And they said, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? And, and look, his mother Mary is here and so uh, it's his uh, brothers and his sisters. How can he be doing these things? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. He went back to uh, the, his early uh, stomping grounds, as it were, there. And they could not and would not accept him. But everybody that believed in him, everybody that came unto him, was healed. The issue was here in Matthew chapter 13 that not many came simply because they rejected him. Everyone who came was healed. Let's be clear. Everybody who came was healed, but the point was not many came simply because of their terrible attitude of unbelief. They couldn't accept that this was Jesus the Christ and to their own detriment. Had they had come to the Saviour, they would have been healed. Amen. Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came down to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? 
How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. In verse 18, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Note that this uh, sickness was attributed to a demon. Again, for a lot of people, that's uh, going to make them uncomfortable. Uh, that's not what we do in our respectable church. But let's get over it, and let's just get on with it, and uh, take it as it is. Anyway, my, that's not the point uh, that I wish to make here. What I want to do is go to verses 19 and 20. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Now, to answer that question, we have a lot of theology and excuses as to why people don't get healed. And this makes us comfortable. We stay sick, of course, but at least we are comfortable. Now, I hope you know that I'm, I'm not being serious about this. Listen to the words of Jesus in response to the disciples' question. The words of Jesus will challenge us and make us uncomfortable. Well, at least it's going to make me uncomfortable. This is what Jesus said in verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. What was the problem? It was the disciples' lack of faith. It was their unbelief, pure and simple. There was no reluctance on God's part. God is glorified in healing and not in sickness, as the scriptures make it abundantly obvious. It was not the will of God that this man should remain sick any longer than he had to. So what we need to do is avoid making some kind of theology uh, around the fact that God somehow uh, wants us to remain sick. That's just a smokescreen for our lack of faith. And I'm not saying that to be unkind or unfair or cruel in any way. It's not my intention that anyone should feel condemned by this. If you are sick and haven't got the healing yet, please don't be condemned. Be encouraged. And this applies to me as much as to anyone else. While I am generally in excellent health, the same is true of my wife and children. And there is not much sickness to speak of on either side, my wife's side or on my side of the family. However, I wear glasses, which unfortunately I can't do without. And I would love for my eyes to be healed. And I've prayed many times about this, but still I wear glasses. But I'm not giving up. And I'm not going to go around sad and condemned about this. What I need to do, what each one of us need to do, is take the rebuke of our Heavenly Father. We need to listen. We need to be challenged. And it doesn't help us if we only want to hear things that reinforce our mindset the way that we think it is. In relation to sickness, we may be of a mindset that we are destined to remain sick all of our lives because this is the will of God. Instead, let's realize where the problem lays and it's not with God. Let's seek Jesus again and again. Let us examine ourselves. Let us hear the word of the Lord and grow in faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Let each one of us be encouraged to know that God is glorified in healing and this is a wonderful thought. Amen. Now, was Paul a sick man? Is there any evidence in the scriptures that can lead us to believe that Paul was a sick and infirmed individual? Here are two verses that are often cited uh, to give credence to the claim that Paul had a, an infirmity in the flesh. Galatians 4 verse 15, where is the blessedness he spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Galatians 6 verse 11, ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Based on the strength of these two passages, it is believed by some that Paul had some kind of significant eyesight problem. Some writers even go so far as to talk about pus dripping from his eyes while he was barely able to scroll out the different epistles that he wrote. Well, with imaginations like that, what can we say? 
In terms of Galatians chapter 4 verse 15, there's a couple of things we need to consider. Firstly, this is nothing more than a figure of speech. Nowadays, we'd say something like, I'd give my right arm or right leg for this thing or that or whatever it is that is especially important to us. Back then, apparently, the common saying was, I'd give you my own eyes if it were possible. The second issue that we need to bear in mind is this. Not long before coming into the region of Galatia, where Paul is writing here, uh, he had been he come across significant problems in, and we read about those in Acts chapter 14, where he was stoned to death or near death, not long before coming into Galatia. So he may well have had puffed up eyes, head, shoulders, knees and toes. Now, if he had puffed up eyes, and we're not saying that he did, if he had puffed up eyes at the time of writing to the Galatians, it was not from being sick, but it was a result of being stoned. In terms of Galatians chapter 6, some say that Paul is writing very large individual letters on the page because he has difficulty seeing. Well, for a guy like me, once I've written past the first page, it starts to become a very large letter. And once again, this is nothing but a figure of speech. And to imply that Paul had an eye problem and that this problem was his thorn in the flesh is to totally misconstrue what Paul has been saying. Some have even gone so far as to say that Paul's eye problem resulted from the events recorded in Acts chapter 9, where Paul was blinded by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. But this simply cannot be true, because it tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, I'll say that again, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, that there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So to attribute the work of Christ in Acts chapter 9 to the messenger of Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is totally ridiculous and is a fabrication. Well, let's now take a look at the Bible evidence considering the status quo of Paul and we'll find that the evidence is actually stacked well against the belief that Paul was a sick man. The facts are these. Paul travelled extensively throughout the Roman Empire over about a 30-year period. And during this time, he preached the gospel of the kingdom and many were saved and many were healed from all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. During this time, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, which is over 30% of the New Testament text. He was also gainfully employed, making tents wherever possible to cover his costs. He was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and on the run from the authorities, and on each and every occasion, he bounced back. Yet, we are to believe that Paul was a weak, sickly man who was almost blind, having eyes dripping with pus or something like this. This simply does not fit with the evidence. So let's now get the context of what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And to do this, we'll read from the preceding chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a day and a night I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. After, after listing down all these difficulties that beset him, why did Paul never once mention sickness? The answer is simple. 
he was not a sick man. This is the end of Paul's thorn in the flesh, part one.